fabulous <laughs> authors joining us in conversation. So we have Melissa as well as Jessica Benoist in conversation with me. So a very huge virtual round of applause to our two authors and a very, very happy book birthday. Thank you so much for joining us and celebrating this amazing book. And hello to everyone in the comments section. Thank you so much for joining us. Just a quick little intro. <laughs> Melissa is an actress best known for her roles in Glee, Whiplash, and the CW series Supergirl, in which she plays Supergirl. And she and her sister Jessica are lifelong readers of fantasy, which at Mysterious Galaxy we give a huge shout out to. That's my favorite genre. And they are passionate about using it as a vehicle for making topical themes accessible for young readers. Together, Melissa and Jessica have written Haven's Secret, the first installment in the powers. Out of you are asking in the questions we got submitted if this was going to be a... So there's your hint that there's probably more to come since this is just the first installment. Um, and the series is a new middle grade fantasy series about two sisters who must come to terms with their extraordinary powers. Now, before we kick things off, and I have a couple questions for Melissa and Jessica, just a little bit of house rules. For this event, we did have everyone submit questions prior to the event, so I know you're wondering, where is the ask a question button? It is not there because I've already got everyone's questions. And if you looked side, you chat section. So a huge shout out to everyone over there. Myself as well as fellow bookseller Nick up front will be in the chats saying hello and dropping any necessary links for y'all. Let's go ahead and get started. Jessica and Melissa, are you ready? Also, if you'd like to say anything, because that was just me talking for like yes. straight. <laughs> so to, to kick things off, you tell us the idea for Haven's Secret to you and the road coming public. That's a big question to kick everything off. <laughs> it is. Jessica, uh, you kick it off. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know where to start. Well, uh, I don't know. It was like something we just started talking about like seven years ago and um we knew we wanted it to really have like a big fantasy feel and be something that anybody um of any age could read like we definitely wanted to write something for younger readers but also have it be something that like we would read as adults and uh it kind of was like, okay, well, if it's going to be fantasy, then what are the powers like? You know, what's the magic like? And Melissa was the one who, like, right from the beginning was like, well, somebody has to talk to animals. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was like, everything just came from there. Like, um, you know, it was just kind of adding in all these ideas and, and what we wanted to see in it. But um, I, I, don't think I'll ever forget that she's like, well, one of the powers has to be that they can talk to animals. So <laughs> it's like who doesn't want to talk to animals? <laughs> also the uh, childhood yeah, cartoon started as to talk to animals. Go ahead. It's a new <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lag a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, go away, take it away. What were you saying about um, about the animals? Uh, I was just going to say yes to second what Jessica was saying. I think we definitely wanted it to appeal to everyone because even now as adults, like the two of us and our family as well, read, like as an adult, I loved Rick Reardon and loved Percy Jackson mm -hmm. and I still reread Harry Potter and I still, I, I think we just wanted to capture that magic to try to fill the void that, that these kinds of books fill. I think um, that's and very the road true. Publishing was, sorry, the lag. Go ahead. <laughs> I was done. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I keep cutting. I'm like, I'm not meaning to cut you off. I'm so sorry. 
Please continue talking <laughs> about such things. <laughs> uh, no, it's all right. It's okay. Just listen Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, everyone. We're yeah. going to see how bad the lag is for a second. <laughs> So for the publishing, what would the publishing like for the two of you? I, I mean, think it was a, sorry, go ahead, Jess. No, you go ahead. It was a, I mean, we've had a long road to publishing to, I would say to finding the right home for this story. Um, but I think it was ultimately the most exciting and rewarding um, road to go down because we ended up with Abrams who we actually absolutely love and they really fostered this and um, really helped us shape it into this magical world that we wanted it to be. Jessica, did you wanna No, I that? I'm gonna wait a dramatic <laughs> I, pause for anyone. Yeah, there's always gonna, <laughs> there's just gonna be a lot of pregnant pauses, everyone. <laughs> Um, yes. definitely agree. Like we just knew Abrams was going to be the place that this book was going to make its home. Um, and it's been fantastic working with them the whole time. So. Yay. Abrams is really awesome on our end to work with too. And I totally agree. Like any good book can be read for like all ages which is my favorite thing about like a good book. So I love that you guys wanted to like fill that void because as they're just like, yes, oh, that's the best thing to hear. So our next question that Parker and Ellie are the two sisters in the book. They have a realistic, complicated relationship. Of course, everyone wants to know, did your own relationship inform how y'all wrote the sisters relationship? I mean, I think that uh, I think that really a lot of sisters could relate to Ellie and Parker's relationship, but there are definitely bits and pieces of Jessica and I in the twins. Um, and also because we have a younger sister as well. And I think Christina is kind of in there, sprinkled in there as well. Um, I think it's inevitable when you grow up in a household full of sisters um, to not carry that into your work um, and have it inform, especially when we're writing about a sisterhood. Um, so they're not like carbon copies of us whatsoever, but there are definitely aspects of each um, that are kind of, I think, inspired by our relationship. And But it, it carries what I think a lot of sisterhoods do and that, you know, sometimes Jessica was saying earlier and she put it so nicely that sometimes your sister is like your best bud and your closest confidant. And then she like steals your sweatshirt and you're like, I'm not going to talk to you for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's a lot of, it's, it's a highly emotional roller coaster having sisters. Um, and that is not, uh, and it's a wonderful roller coaster to be on in all the best ways. And, and we have that in, uh, there's a plethora of that in this book. <laughs> I don't know, I'm full of words today. Pregnant pauses and a plethora of. <laughs> a plethora. Of How many keywords? <gasps> um, what if you the writing? Um, I just think, you know, there are these like small little personality type bits um, of each of us. And like Melissa said, like the roller coaster and, you know, this is the book. So we're taking like all these different types of interactions um, that might not normally happen in such a short span and like cramming it into the short span. So it's like really emotionally heightened and you get to see that roller coaster go throughout the book. Um, so, you know, we don't really share a lot of... Um, like she was saying, not like a lot of direct comparisons with the characters um, 
in how we grew up versus how they grew up. And, you know, I would say on the whole, we had a much closer relationship growing up than like the the way that we portray the girls in the book. But that's because they have this journey they have to go on mm-hmm. to kind of find that balance and that connection. Um, mm-hmm. So that's that's what I would say. Our I our that. childhood might not have <laughs> made the most interesting story because we were <laughs> we you know we just did I don't know everything. What you're talking about I thought I think we were hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> ah, and they loved each other and they all got along really well <laughs> yeah there wasn't a lot of conflict like you know <laughs> oh, so continuing to talk about the two sisters one of them can communicate with and the other one can harness the element so are both of you animal and or need be fuzzy friends slash that are not fuzzy that you would like to talk about with everyone. <laughs> we are both big nature lovers and big mm-hmm. animal lovers. Um, at one point in our house, how many animals did we have? We had two cats Four. and two dogs. Four. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I, I mean, I've known people that have had a lot more animals than that, but they would all hang out in our mom's bed. Um, Yes, this book was very much inspired by our love of nature that we kind of, our entire family uh, kind of garnered from our grandparents um, Mm -hmm. who would take us all up into the mountains and uh, we'd go on these long drives with our grandparents and it's like such a vivid, wonderful memory of mine um, that grandpa would always be playing classical music and we'd be driving through the beautiful Colorado mountainside and the Rockies and um, so yes, this book is definitely inspired by that and we both love it very much. Um, and we, we do have hilarious animals now as well, that <laughs> I wish we could talk to. I have two dogs, one of whom is maybe a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> maybe? She is. And I've had her for 11 years and she's, a, she's a piece of work and I love her dearly. She's a Jack Russell. And then uh, I have another dog, Drift, who I feel like if I could hear what he was saying, he would just be saying, oh, I love you, mom. I love you over and over and over again. He's a sweetheart. Um, I have a cat and he's very, he's a cat. I mean, he's just a cat, like he he has moments of very sweet, and he's not mean he just prefers like his own world (laughs) and in march no it he was born in march at the end of april we got a puppy and his name is marty he's named after martin short and that's basically who he is i mean i thought he was named after marty mcfly yeah we call him marty but it's two because Melissa, Truman wanted to name him after the movie Clifford. And I was like, well, I'll name him Martin Short. (laughs) We're the only family on the planet that actually knows that movie. I guarantee you, none of these people, no one, if anyone has seen the movie Clifford, I will be so impressed. Like, say it now in the chat if you've seen Clifford. (laughs) And tell us your favorite line. Like, no. I confess, I never, I read the books, but I never saw the movie. No. It's not, no, it's not the big red dog. It's Martin Short playing a 10-year-old boy. Yes, Yes. like an evil, an evil psychopath 10-year-old boy. Yes. (laughs) He's trying to get his uncle (laughs) to take him to Dinosaur World. Yes, it's a, it's it's a, just give yourself a treat and go watch it. And you'll think that we are very strange people. (laughs) All of a sudden, the yeah. views for Clifford are going to go up, and whoever made it is, oh, going, yeah. is going on. What is happening right now? Uh, <laughs> Why are people? 
That is absolutely amazing. I, I am a cat, <laughs> so I, I feel you on the, I am a cat. I will sit on you when I decide to give you my company and show you my butt and mm -hmm. you will be honored by it. But um, yeah. I, I wish there were dog collars, Melissa, because I would love to have like the up moment where it's just like the dog saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. It'd be so nice to hear oh, that yeah. every single day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, so our next. Oh my gosh, the question. affirmations I would receive from Drift would be amazing. Right, right. You don't need social media if you could just get affirmations from your like fluffy friend. No. Problem yeah. solved. Yes. I feel like so, right now mine's still at an age where he would just be bossing me around, though. <laughs> that's kind of just what he does now, just with barks. Very squeaky he parts. Gets through the like the baby teenage phase, and then he'll be in like that sweet spot of just positiveness. <laughs> so the next question we have is a world building question, which I always think is fun. And this one is that the world of powers is similar to the world of Supergirl, and that it's similar to our world, but it also has magic in it. So kind of what was the process for creating essentially a contemporary world that has the sisters' magical abilities, and what inspired you? Well, Jess, I don't know if you remember this, but in one of our initial discussions about it, um, we we definitely wanted this to feel really grounded um, and to feel we wanted the landscape and nature to kind of be its own character. And um, we actually mm -hmm. referenced, because both of us are Cormac McCarthy readers, this is obviously he is not a children's no. author. <laughs> <laughs> We were like almost the children's version of that, way less gory, way less um, intense. <laughs> but that was a def that was a part of kind of the initial conversations and brainstorming was that we wanted it to feel that rooted, um, especially because we were dealing with things like the environment. Yeah, and I think even in those earlier discussions too, like um, I remember definitely we when we were trying to flesh out the magic and like how it worked and where it came from, like it, it is this very long standing fantasy type thing to have uh, powers coming from or do it like having to do with nature. Mm -hmm. um, even like, you know, in Lord of the Rings, you have like sort of this druidic thing and you've got like the Ents and there's all this very like deeply nature rooted magic to, going on and like Radagast with all his animals and things like that. Um, and a lot of like, um, you know, just so much lore out there in so many different mythologies. And we didn't really tie it directly to anything like that. But I mean, with us being so, having read so much fantasy and just kind of overall being like fantasy nerds, there you have all these sort of ideas of, um, elements and nature to draw from in fantasy and how those get used uh, in terms of like building out magic systems. I love Dungeon that. I feel like, right? <laughs> Who doesn't love all of that? Oh my gosh, so many people. I did not know Dungeons and Dragons has been the pivotal point for many an author and you don't find that out until you're talking with them. But <laughs> <laughs> big stuff. Right? I love <laughs> from magic. There's something that's awesome about magic coming from the earth, and I think it connects with like a lot of readers. So I think that's really awesome that your magic system connects so strongly with nature. Um, so our next question we have is, Melissa, how does it feel to be ending Supergirl? And do you have a favorite memory from on set? Uh, I mean, how does it feel? It's kind of uh it's really difficult to describe and i think i'll probably be able to talk about it with more clarity in a couple years once i'm further away from it but right now it feels sort of like a melting pot of all the emotions it's a very bittersweet um i was really tired you guys so i'm i was ready for a break <laughs> but uh that being said i really miss uh i'm gonna miss it and i already do um, we wrapped like two months ago. And my favorite memory on set, that's so hard. It's impossible to choose, you know, six years um, with 
the same people day in, day out. I have a lot of good memories with my husband, Chris. When he was on the mm-hmm. show, we had a lot of fun. Um, there, you know what? I, I would have to say, if I had to pick one, my favorite memory, there was an episode we did. We were shooting a scene in this random rock quarry, like in the middle of nowhere, and it was raining, and Kevin Smith was directing and got us like a hot dog bacon it was a bacon food truck they literally just served bacon and it was pouring rain and we were playing like board games and heads up in this random school bus it was just the most random night and it any other time like sometimes those days could be so hard but for whatever reason that day was a really great one we just had we made lemonade out of lemons and it was so fun it was like a slumber party that sounds we amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, they do say that bacon makes everything better. Normally it's in regards <laughs> to others, but still that sounds like an absolute amazing time. <laughs> um, and speaking of obvious, um, the powers, Heaven's Gate is out. But speaking about getting to kind of start new chapters and whatnot, is what are the two of you working on now? For example, book two maybe, and what are some of your upcoming projects that you can share with us? Uh, we are uh, looking at um, some, we're, we're working on book two. Um, after we we're get- Preliminary through, stages. Yes. And after we get through, you know, launch week and, and all this, then it's really gonna kick in a little more. Um, I, oh gosh, um, I have a trilogy that I should be writing the third book to. <laughs> and it's like a third written, but um, I definitely am like trying to squeeze it in uh, between, you know, what we have going on with Haven Secret, and um, I am I'm really excited to start book two because um, I think I don't want to spoil anything for anybody who hasn't finished yet. Probably a lot of people haven't finished yet uh, if they just got it today. <laughs> um, but I think let let me just say I think there's going to be a lot more movement. If that makes sense. Does that sound like good way of putting it? Yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, I, I'm I'm excited to see like where it all goes and how it how it ends up. Super exciting, Melissa. What about you? I'm like I don't want to interrupt you. Like I'm, I'm trying to give like the appropriate <laughs> pregnant pause, but then I'm like, ah. <laughs> um, well, I am enjoying some freedom. Um, I just started a production company with Warner Brothers. So I'm working on development stuff, which is exciting and, and uh, seeing what I can get off the ground there. Uh, uh and you know being a mom which is really nice um and i'm really enjoying that and just um tiptoeing kind of back into normal life because uh supergirl kind of was my life for six years so now i'm kind of uh rediscovering what life looks without that yay and with getting to tiptoe back into normal life. This is a good segue for my question before we have a reading. But my next question is, what are you reading now? And because when you have more time, you get to read more books. I have absolutely no bias as a reader when I say that. But um, and then um, also the second end for that question is, what was your favorite book to read as a kid? You go first. Okay, no, you go. First. Um, what was I just? I just read. I was reading the heartbreaking work of a staggering genius because I'd never read it. Um, and I do like Dave Eggers. Um, and I 
don't. I'm actually looking for a new book to read now. Um, I've also been reading a lot for work. Um, so that's why I'm, I haven't read a lot of novels, which is usually what I'm reading. Um, did. I mean, I was a Harry Potter obsessive. I was like the demographic. Um, like I got the first three when I was 10 or 11, and then I graduated high school when the seventh one came out. So it kind of encapsulated my childhood. So those were really, really pivotal for me, but I also loved A Wrinkle in Time. Um, and Jurassic Park was one of my favorite books. Yeah, I'll agree. Jurassic Park, I think I read, you know, lots and lots of stuff before, but I read Jurassic Park, I think when I was in sixth grade and that was really the book that made me realize like, oh, this is why adults read for fun. Like, Mm -hmm. it's kind of that book that you read that like you see, I hadn't seen the movie before I read the book. I think my mom actually gave it to me saying, if this isn't scary for you, then you can watch the movie. And mm -hmm. so I, I went through the book, I, I read the book and, but like I saw it as a movie in my head. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really for me, like helped me transition out of reading more like, um, children's literature and like fantasy type literature then like then I started reading more like sci-fi and that kind of stuff um what I'm reading right now um I'm reading Lost by Gregory Gregory Maguire I've been going back and reading like all the non-wicked Gregory Maguire mm -hmm. um I read After Alice it was fantastic um and so I'm reading Lost by Gregory Maguire and um I just read uh, Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. I probably didn't say that right. Um, and so then I went and bought like a lot of, I've read a couple books of his, but I made sure I got all of his paperbacks too. And I, I definitely recommend any what of his stuff. What else did he write? Um, Remains of the Day, I think right. was a Nobel winner um he didn't write never let me no he yes he, never yeah, that's what he oh, wrote that never let me go and the first one i read of his i read like right before the pandemic and it was the buried giant and it is like one of the fa my favorite books i've ever read it's incredible mm -hmm. so, i remember definitely what i was reading before heartbreaking work what i was just finishing um and i just lost it oh uh the great believer Hmm. and it broke my heart if you want a good cry it's about the aid crisis in the 80s yes mm. oh but those books even though they make you cry are some of the most like important ones to like read sometimes oh mm -hmm. okay yeah. well it's like a little life right yeah and then i get to dive back into fantasy and then disappear into some happiness <laughs> it's a good balance <laughs> to have the two yeah so we have a little game coming up where we are going to test these sisters on how well they know each other. But before we hop in to the game, <laughs> Melissa is going to draw a little thing so you get a little taste of Heaven's Secret. So I'm going to pass it, pass it on to Melissa for her to do a little reading. All right, here we go. This is chapter five. Maggie's house of breakfast was one of the only places in Harborville that served breakfast 24 hours per day. You could also get non-breakfast items like Salisbury steak, not that anyone wanted to, or mozzarella sticks, but Parker always stuck me. Maggie's was reserved for particular occasions, weekends, lift up after tough things like when Parker broke her ankle during field hockey and had to have it set and report card dinners assuming both Parker and Ellie had worked hard and tried their best. They had never gone on Parker and Ellie's birthday though but the unspoken rule they had about Maggie's was above all they only went there for happy occasions. It was a huge surprise then when out of nowhere Parker's dad started talking about great aunt Mabel and great uncle George like it was no big deal. 
Of the millions of things a person could talk about at Parker's favorite breakfast place, this particular subject would have been last on her guest list. Her dad didn't even bring it up during the hour standard that they were waiting outside with the hipsters for a table. Well, Maggie's didn't accept reservations, even for birthdays. Or while they were opening the rest of their gifts as their food was being prepared. He waited until Parker was about to dig into her favorite pancakes, one of Maggie's specialties, the anything you want pancakes that Parker had loaded up with blueberry, ginger, and chocolate chips. Ellie's were peanut, banana, and chocolate chips. I have some news, he said, sipping his coffee. Actually, uh, a few pieces of news. Ellie paused, her spoon hovering ab above her bowl of rice pudding. She squished her eyebrows together. When? Her father sipped his Diet Coke. Tomorrow. Parker almost choked on her pancake. Tomorrow? Who are these people? Have we even met them? You met them once when you were babies, their dad said, avoiding her eyes. They're your mom's aunt and uncle, their brother and sister. Parker looked over at Ellie, who sipped her orange juice and didn't seem too perturbed. Parker turned to stare at her father. Our aunt, great aunt, Ellie clarified. Great aunt Mabel and great uncle George. Parker took a sip from her water glass, whom we've basically never met before. We'll be here tomorrow? Yes, her father placed his hands on the table. What for? Are they in town on a trip? Ellie asked. Well, actually, that's the other part of news. Her father paused to rub his face, which was something Parker had seen him do on really difficult phone calls. He sighed. Girls, Mabel and George aren't just coming for a visit. They are coming to spend time with you. You know how I'm always being asked to cover international events for the Tribune, but I always turn them down because you need me at home? Yes, said Ellie. She looked solemn. Parker didn't say anything. Of course he turned these things down. Who was supposed to take care of them? Ellie's goldfish? Well, he went on, I have decided to accept a long-term assignment in Holland. What? Parker screeched, dropping her fork into her mush of pancakes. She had a million questions asked, but her throat was too tight. Why hadn't he asked them what they thought? How long would he be gone? Why had he made a huge decision without seeing how she and Ellie felt? How long term, asked Ellie asked calmly. But Parker could see she was worried. Eight weeks, their dad said, just the summer, and I'm gonna try to come back once in the middle if I can. I know it seems abrupt, but the truth is the author came in several months ago in January. I turned it down because I can never stand being away from you girls. He took a deep breath. But then they, come, uh, but then they came back to me and doubled their offer. This will give us a lot of financial security, enough so I can spend more time with you in the future. I can cheer you on at Ultimate, Parker, and I can help you plant a garden out back, Ellie. You'll see. It'll be good for us in the long run. I don't want you to go, Ellie said in a small voice. Oh, L. Bean. Their dad grabbed each of their hands. I don't want to go either. If I'm being honest, I'd much rather spend my summer at home with you. But the truth is, your mother wanted this for you. Parker and Ellie exchanged a look. Mom wanted you to abandon us and move to Europe? What does this have to do with Mabel and George? Parker demanded, retrieving her hand. Mom wanted you to spend some time with her side of the family, he explained. It was very important to her that you get to know Mabel and George when you were old enough. She spent a lot of time with them when she was a kid, and she was crazy about them. Then how come we've never met them, Parker asked, if Mom loved them so much? because they lived all over the country. They've always been far flung. There were too many things going on at once. Mabel and George were visiting. She had to get to know them for some reason. Her dad was going away. Parker felt the same kind of overwhelming sensation she felt when Mr. Gifford sprang a pop quiz in math. Like nothing made any sense and things were way too daunting and she only wanted to lay her head on her desk and fall asleep and figure it out later. Then she remembered something. Well, I won't be around anyway, Parker informed them. Sorry, Ellie, you're on your own. Parker knew she was being a little mean, but she wasn't going to give up competitive ultimate training for anything. She'd been meaning to share her good news over Sundays until her announcement got hijacked by this other news. Oh, shoot, her dad ran his hand through his hair. I completely forgot you tried out for cut. I'm, I'm so sorry, Parker, you'll have to wait till next year. But why? 
Parker's voice was so loud the couple at the table next to them looked over. She could feel her face getting hot the way it always did when she was upset. In fact, her whole body was hot. Her summer was going to be perfect. It was all planned. Her dad couldn't do this to her. This was what your mom wanted, her dad repeated, and it's time. Why is it time, Ellie wanted to know. We just turned 12 this morning. Is this what happens when you become a grown-up? Things just happen even if you don't want them to? Their dad laughed. Parker folded her arms over her chest and frowned harder. That happens when you're a kid too, Ellie. Parker stared at her sister pointedly. It's true, their dad said, but I think what Ellie's getting at is that sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do as you get older. Handle more responsibility, even if it isn't fun. And to answer your question, now being it's time because your aunt and uncle think it is. And I happen to agree. You're mature enough to learn the value of a sacrifice. Happy birthday to us, Parker let out a dramatic sigh. I still don't understand why I can't go to cut while you're away. It's the perfect solution. It's a whole supervised sleepaway camp. You won't even have to worry about me. Ellie likes old people. She can hang out with them in Harborville while Clara and I are away. She'll be fine, right, Ellie? Ellie looked sour. I'd rather you be here, too, she said to her sister. Well, actually, her dad cleared his throat. There's another part of it. Just then, the waitress came over to the table. How are we doing? She wanted to know. Need any boxes? No, thanks, Ellie said politely. No, thanks, Parker grumbled. Did Ellie not care? Was she not angry? Of course she wasn't. She didn't have Clara and cut. She could just do what she usually did in the summer, like talk at her fish and grow tomato plants in the backyard and transfer ants out of the kitchen on a piece of peanut butter smudged loose leaf paper. Why could she not be normal? When the waitress walked away, their dad looked different. The reason you can't go to Cut is that you aren't just getting to know Mabel and George here in Harborville, he told them, looking them each in the eye. You're going to go with them to their farm up north in the mountains. They have someone who looks after it while they're away, but apparently they can use an extra couple of hands right now. It's the perfect opportunity for you to learn something new and live somewhere different and do some of the things your mom did as a kid. Haven helped her become who she was, and I happen to think she was pretty great. There's a lot more to the world than Harborville can offer you, or even that I can offer you by myself. Besides, he said, attempting a joking tone, it's time you got a little country to balance out the city slippers in you. Suddenly, Maggie's pancakes felt like a pile of rocks in Parker's stomach. I know it's sudden, Parker's voice sounded tired, and it's not ideal. The good thing is, it's a week to summer vacation, so you won't miss much school. What? Parker shrieked. We're supposed to go to this farm before we even finish the school year? Tomorrow morning, her dad said. Even Ellie looked like she might puke. Why so soon? It's when George and Mabel are able to come collect you, he said. I'm sorry, I've already told your teachers and... Does everyone know about this except us? Parker's blood was now boiling, and she felt a strange, tingling sensation all over. She tried to stay calm as the waitress dropped off their check. No, her dad said firmly. George and Mabel just called me this morning. He slipped his credit card in a little black folder and handed it back to the waitress. But Ellie looked at her empty plate as if the news had just settled in her stomach, like her breakfast for dinner. They're strangers, Parker finished. Well, Parker's father leaned forward. That's a reason to look forward to this. You don't know your mom's family, and I know she wanted it for you. It's going to be strange, and it's going to take getting used to. Ellie shuffled in her chair. I guess eight weeks isn't so bad, she said. Parker turned and stared at her sister. Ellie was studying her father's face like it was a menu. That's right, her father shifted, somehow pulling the conversation to a close as he signed the bill and scooted his chair out from under the table. Eight weeks is just a blip in the grand scheme of things. Parker stood up, her feet sticking a little to the syrup on the floor. Somehow, even after the four pancakes she'd managed to eat, she felt empty. But more than that, she felt angry. Just after they slipped through the door and began walking to their car, she understood why. It was cut, but it was also more than cut. She stopped in her tracks. Dad, he and Ellie turned around. Parker knew they weren't going to like what she was about to say. But that was growing up, right? Growing up meant facing things they didn't like. 
Why not start now? Why do we have to do a thing mom wanted us to do? She disappeared. She left us. You and Ellie just want to believe she died in the ocean because it's easier, but we don't know that. The only thing we know is she's gone, but we're all here acting like she still calls all the shots. For a second, her dad's face flickered with frustration. Ellie looked like she was about to cry. Parker felt bad, as terrible as she felt when their mom went away in the first place. Then Ellie took her dad's hand and his face softened. Now he just looked sad. <clears throat> Come here, sweet pea, he said to Parker, waving her closer. Parker stepped into his embrace right there in the parking lot, relieved. She'd said the most horrible thing, but her dad was hugging her anyway. He wrapped his arms around both girls. Your mom loved you girls more than anything, he said. But I think you'll understand that better if you learn more about her life. And Haven is the best place to do that. Mm -hmm. Ta <laughs> That's such a good chapter. Oh my goodness. And we had, I'm going to ask one little quick question. Is there an audio book? Yes. There is an audio book. And we did it. Melissa. No. Oh, yes. Wait, so did y'all narrate? Mm hmm. We did. We oh my gosh, okay, that <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so amazingly awesome. Sorry, I had to ask because so many people were asking in the chat and I was like, <laughs> okay, yes, so awesome. Okay, sweet. Everyone, now you need to look as well. But uh, <laughs> so now we're gonna move in to the game of all of these sisters know each other. So the pregnant pause will actually come in handy. What we're going to do is I am going to go back and forth asking um, between Jessica and Melissa questions about other. And as the audience, you get to guess the answers. I will do like a five second countdown on my fingers to let y'all in the comments. And the other sister will say yay or nay and give us the correct answer. So, Melissa. Just are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Let's go. Okay. First question is for Saka. For me. How did Melissa dress up for being in fifth grade? Fifth grade. Okay. I don't know if this was fifth or sixth grade, but this is relevant <laughs> to recent interviews you did. I'm going to say that that was the year that you did Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat because you did it for your birthday party and then you did it for Halloween one year because it's like close, you know, is that it? Was that fifth grade or sixth grade? Do I answer? Do you say if I'm yes. wrong? Yeah, right, right or wrong. <laughs> you were close. Joseph was seventh grade. Yes, the answer to this was, I really don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but it, the odds are, I said by default, it could have been Obi-Wan Kenobi because I was Obi-Wan a couple of times. But I couple times. honestly <laughs> have no recollection of what I was for Halloween in the fifth grade. I have no idea. Okay. I would have been I'm impressed sure if you had, because I was like, I but I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, like you, your Obi Wan costume like got worn multiple times, and then I was like three different versions of Princess Leia. So yeah, you were like Hoth Leia, <laughs> yeah. Leia Organa. Like, help me, Obi Wan Kenobi. Yes. Your Hoth Leia was on point. Which pro tip. If you're going trick or treating in a cold place in the United States, Hoth Leia. It's Smart. like, yeah, it's just you're in really. Winter clothes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Strategic costuming. That is yes. a good pro tip. <laughs> so the next one is for Melissa. So Melissa, what is Jay's favorite food? 
Jessica's favorite food? Oh, that's hard. Um, um, <laughs> I mean, I know that she cooks really healthily for herself and her family, like very healthy. Um, cause I've eaten her healthy food. But your favorite cuisine? Mm, I would guess. Uh, Sushi? It's close. I said seafood. That's hard to pick. Oh, seafood. I know. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I should have known that. I don't. I, I couldn't pick like that. a like sushi or Italian or, or anything like that. But I was like, well, I know everywhere I go, I get seafood. You do eat a lot it. of fish, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Next question, Jessica. Yes. As a kid. What did Melissa want to be when she grew up? Oh my God, everybody knows this. A paleontologist. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why I saw Gyros as the guest for the Halloween costume. There we go, that makes, that makes sense then. Okay, Melissa, who would Jessica say is the better yeah, cook? Ready. Is the better cook? Who? Mm -hmm. She'd probably say her because I don't think she's eaten a lot of my cooking. Okay. I've eaten your cooking <laughs> because I have you. Because I yeah. feel like every time for the past, at least for the past like five or six years, when we see each other like on holidays and everyone in the family's cooking, I'm usually like burnt out and asleep on the couch because I'm like coming from work. So I feel like I haven't cooked for Jessica in a very long time. <laughs> No, oh, we all do I stuff. I love cooking, though. Yeah. No, I... Sorry, so what's your answer? And then I'll say... <laughs> <laughs> My answer... <laughs> I did say... But to be fair, my answer was me by just a little bit. But I know that you are a really good cook. And I think the only reason I said that like me by just a little bit is just because like, I think I've maybe done it more. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah but I do think that you're, cause... I think you're a better baker than I am. Look, I know you're a better baker than I am. I'm not good at baking. And you tell me the stuff that you bake and I'm like, that's not happening here. <laughs> I do bake a lot. <laughs> baking is like therapy for me. Yeah. Oh. I wish, I'm I'm definitely with Jessica. I wish I was a good baker, but uh, nope. I, I try, <laughs> and if it's like something where I can just kind of dump a bunch of stuff in there, it works great. Yeah. But precision, though, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jessica, the next question is: According to Melissa, who is Parker, and who is Ellie in real life? Um. I think we both agree that I am Parker and she is Ellie. Mm -hmm. We have a nod of confirmation. Melissa, who would Jessica say yeah. is the sillier I have sister? I should audibly said something. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of just like. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, knowing look Jessica was enough. We could tell through sister. the screen. What? You're the sister? I think Melissa, Melissa said that she is the oh, sillier I said, sister. I think Jess would say that I was the sillier sister. I did say that. I, I did. <laughs> and then our final, final question. Jessica, what would Melissa consider the best gift she has received? A hard um, one. <laughs> a hard one. <laughs> this is really um, hard. Okay. Um, I have two things. Um, I feel like you might get this. What I what I want to say is a joke. That I think the just a uh, tracker. <laughs> he wasn't mine. He was Christina's. Oh. Uh, 
Wait, I thought that was you. <laughs> no. It was okay. a baby baby uh, named Tracker. <laughs> yes. It was not for me. <laughs> um, basically, like, there was this year that um, our dad put a CD-ROM in our computer. And I think ever since, like, every single Christmas since then, we would get, like, some kind of computer game. And that was always, like, the most exciting thing for us. Um, we would, like, immediately be planning, like, for, from December 25th till whatever day in January we had to go back to school, like, how we were going to trade off getting to play the new computer game. Our, our mom had to set, she's right, by the way. I knew you were going to get this. I said anytime we got <laughs> The Sims or Roller Coaster Tycoon or Zoo yes, Tycoon. Yes, Zoo Tycoon, Quest for Glory. Games, yeah. Yeah. Our mom literally had to set a timer because we would Egg fight time. like hardcore fights over whose turn it was to play the computer. And sometimes we would play until like five o'clock in the morning <laughs> during winter break. <laughs> like, so yeah. then it got better slightly better if it was a year when we got like a computer game and then like the PlayStation came out and we had a PlayStation. Oh, yeah. And then if we got a computer game and a PlayStation, then it was just this like, you know, then you had something to do while the other one got the computer game, then you could go play like in the Indiana Jones game on the PlayStation or whatever. So that helped yeah. things a little. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you were that gonna was get very that. Strategic and that was a hard question. <laughs> I know, like the Obi Wan Kenobi and Sims. I mean, you guys know each other very well. That's just it's a testament to that. Um, so now we're going to move into our audience <laughs> questions. Uh, thank you, thank you to everyone for submitting all of your questions. We did have some overlap, and we just got a lot of questions. So I go and picked some, but I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for taking time to question. So question that we're going to start off with was what was the best thing about working on the book, especially as sisters? I just, I just think it's so cool, like, just getting to make things up. Like, that's what we did as kids. Shows. I mean, we were those kids who were like, "Come see our show <laughs> on oh, the holidays." In our basement. Yeah, stuff. and like, so just getting into that very like very imaginative, childlike mode again as adults was like really nice to just be able to like, "Ooh, this idea, this idea, let's do this." Um, that's just it's really it's fun. It's just really fun and exciting. You get off of like what well, we had to do almost all of it like in this exact type setting um, or on the phone because a lot of this took place during the pandemic, but it was like, you'd get off the phone or we'd get out of a little zoom meeting and it would just be like, man, that was awesome. That was fun. Yeah. Agreed. Nice. Um, let's see. You're very talented. Oh no. Hello. Hello. Oh no! Oh no! I, no, you're back. This is when I get to make a horrible joke about the fact that there's magic in the book and magic and technology don't get along, so I disappeared for a second. Um, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> but the next question that we have is that you're both very talented, just in general, creatively talented people. And would you both ever consider writing a feature script together? I, I, don't I don't see why not. I, yeah, I don't think there's any, the sky's the limit. Nice. Everyone stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> the um, next question specifically was for you, Melissa. And this, what was it like an actor to an author and kind of the transition from jumping into one form to the other? Um, I mean, it's, wildly different um and i'm i'm not you know i'm still on that learning curve uh also just because it's two in totally different industries mm. and i think that to me was the most um like jumping into the deep end of a really cold pool because i've gotten to know the entertainment industry in hollywood 
pretty well for the last decade. And um, I don't know why, but for some reason I was like, oh, they can't be that different. Publishing is a whole <laughs> different ball game. <laughs> it's a whole different ball game. And it is, um, that's been, um, it's for me, I think the, the most eye opening to navigate. Nice. And then this is the question we were talking about earlier that all authors get asked. So of course we're going to be asking you guys, and this is advice uh, for aspiring authors especially with the publishing world, because it is a whole different world into itself. Um, um, for the writing part of it is um, just, just know that um, if, if writing is something that you enjoy doing and you're passionate about, there is a book in you. Mm. Um, and you just have to keep writing. Um, not everything that comes out of you is the book, mm. but there's one in there, you know? So practicing, um, finding opportunities, finding communities where people will prompt you, uh, people will look at your work and that's been I think the most helpful thing for me um, in just developing how I first of all feel about people reading my work that is a big thing for a lot of people who write when you're starting off maybe you're a little bit younger or even if you're older and it's just a, a hobby or a passion that's turned into something you want to pursue those first couple times that you give somebody what you've written is really hard it's a very hard thing to do. Um, you know, you get nervous um, and a little uh, insecure about it. But once you get that that connection with someone and that feedback from somebody, it's it's really all so much easier from there. You just have to like stick your toes in the water a couple times um, and then learn how to apply all of that um, input and feedback that you do get. Um, so that's been, <clears throat> I'd say one of the most helpful things to me. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like some great big writer community. It could just be mm -hmm. a friend who's also interested in reading or writing. It could be a family member that you trust that's, um, that, you know, I, I say definitely somebody who reads a lot. Um, yeah. That's maybe the only prerequisite. Somebody that reads a lot that you trust um, and who's going to give you some feedback. Um, and and then just know that, like, you're going to get better at it. And so it's just something that you have to make yourself do, not worrying about necessarily, like, how great it is while you're doing it. Because... He, everything that goes out into the world gets edited so that it's the way that it is when it goes out into the world, right? Um, so as far as, um, you know, the publishing industry, that sort of thing, I mean, I've self-published novels and this has definitely been a very interesting experience for me as well. Um, but it, as Melissa was saying, it is a very, like, it, it's its own world. And so if that's something that you're interested in, um, and even if you're interested in going the self-publishing route as well, that is its own monster too. Like, there are things that you do for that um, that don't really go on in traditional publishing and vice versa. So you do, if you have that book, the book that was in you, uh, you ha you that's like the first step. And you have to uh, do a little bit of, of learning there too, so that you at least know, um, you know, sort of what's expected, what types of communication and who you're gonna be communicating to. I think it is probably the most important thing, the steps of, how the book gets from point A to out into the world. 
learning a little bit about that. And there are thousands and thousands of resources out there. So, um, you know, just be willing to learn. I mean, that's everything in life, right? <laughs> That's so true. Melissa, do you have any additional writing advice? Oh, no, I think I echoed. I think she's oh, on mute. You're on mute still. So if you go to the little bar that'll pop and hover your mouse over the screen, there's a little mic button. And if you click that, it should turn your mic back on. I was trying to read her lips, but I, I know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe your air. Yes, great. Everyone, we're going to charade Set. audio <laughs> death and ear. Here, while we have technical difficulties, we are going to wait, wait. Oh, no. Also, I'm try refreshing your page, maybe. Sometimes that will help. Mm -hmm. Have you hit the refresh button? So my chat stopped working. Did anybody say that they had seen Clifford? <laughs> right. Okay, yeah. Everyone, we are now going to discuss who has seen the tragic and disturbing tale of Clifford. <laughs> but while we have, um, while Mel is refreshing and getting back on, I actually have another question um, for you that is another writing question that you can speak okay. on. Jessica, and that is, what was it like, especially because you've written previously, like, books as a solo author, so what was it like writing a book together with Melissa and combining two ideas into one and writing together? I, I think you kind of, like, used the word that I would say is the best part and the hardest part, like... <laughs> You like that thing in interviews, like, what's your greatest uh, weakness? And so it's like, why my greatest strength is my weakness or whatever. Like, it's kind of that double edged sword, mm -hmm. right? Combining, you get this plethora of ideas. Um, <laughs> and that's so helpful. Like, it <laughs> helps give this depth and like this uh, abundance of things to work with. And, and I think it makes everything in the book like. Uh, but at the same time, it's like you can't have every single idea um, so that, uh, you know, deciding exactly how you're going to incorporate everything or which things you're not going to incorporate um, is is sort of the that's the catch. You know, it's not that hard. I've written um, other books books with people. Um, I've done some collaborative writing and I've done some uh, ghost writing and with other people. And, and I don't think it's like so hard that it's ever like this negative feeling by any means. Um, but it is mm -hmm. like, it's different. It's much different um, than just like, yeah. okay, here's my outline and then and just go, um, you know? Yeah. So I enjoy it. I, I, I've heard some authors who don't enjoy it. I enjoy it. I think having more ideas is always better. I think that's awesome. Like, process. And like you said, like story, you wouldn't have even on your own because you have like the best ideas from two people. Melissa, the question, it was um, kind of what was it? Coming the ideas that both you and had and putting those into one book and kind of what this was like. Having, uh, combining our ideas. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I mean, I, I, like Jess was saying, I think the more ideas, the better. And this kind of, uh, yeah. we, I don't know if we ever really disagreed that much on, 
um, ideas that would come up, Jessica and I would kind of both gravitate towards the same um, direction. Um, I struggle really because I can be really indecisive. So that's something that I struggled with was really just deciding where I thought this, I wanted the story to go or, um, but it was nice mm -hmm. to have Jessica uh, there with me um, to kind of uh, help my indecisiveness. <laughs> And be like, nope, we are make yes. vision. Kind of like, and I'm the opposite too, because I do get, you know, sort of stuck in my whole like, this, just going and writing is I'm kind of the opposite where it's like, we throw a bunch of ideas out and I naturally have one that I like, kind of like better. And then it's hard for me to talk myself out of it. Because <laughs> in my head, I'm like, I already see it this way. I don't, I don't know <laughs> if I can change it now, but there, you know, uh, you do like you, you just, know what it's is a, the best yeah. and what what works and that's what you go with so it's your example of with your powers combined you guys become super <laughs> author essentially because you balance each other out and so my final question because we all have time but my final question i wanted to end it on a fun one is talking about imaginations and whatnot be transported to any fictional world one day I am throwing in the caveat that you would not die nor get injured because fictional worlds tend to be very dangerous um it's an important caveat to ask in that question but what would you do or where would you want to go in this Jess, you can go first i said i said in an earlier uh Q and A that I wanted to go to Jurassic Park, and Melissa's like, "That's dangerous." <laughs> See, now I'm not gonna die, so we're good. Um, but I think also I was thinking, um, and I kind of mentioned that I had read that Alice book. I, I think Wonderland would be really cool. I'm I've been in love with the Disney movie for a long time, and I've read the books um, as an adult, and. You know, I just love nonsense. Something like uh, Alice, like Wonderland or like uh, the Chocolate Factory or something where where it's just chaos and nonsense and silliness. Like that's, that's probably where I would go. And uh, if I went to Wonderland, I would definitely play croquet mm. with a flamingo. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to hold a flamingo. So no flamingo would be harmed. <laughs> no flamingos would be harmed in the visiting flamingo. of this fantasy <laughs> travel movie one. <laughs> um, I, Melissa, I said you. earlier, and I think this is always my answer because I'm such a Lord of the Rings fan. Um, I think it would be Middle Earth, but I have to say it would. It would be Rivendell um, in Middle Earth specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jess, now that you've mentioned the Chocolate Factory, I think Ooh. Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory is a really, really good answer. Mostly because I'm a sugar fiend, so That's I would be seen. a this globe. <laughs> the, when they I'm do not kidding. <laughs> pure imagination in the movie, I remember as a kid, I was always just like, you just I want, want to eat, eat like, all of that. Eats the tea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Or like the or giant. The gum, I always want to gum the, the, gum. the giant gummy bear off the tree. I was always like, yes. Why is guys, this not a chocolate that I get to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And because of the caveat, you wouldn't get stuck in a tube that there fed the go. chocolate river. So see the caveat. It builds. But um, <laughs> so I want to I want to thank you so much, Jessica, so much to Melissa for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for your patience. Greg. I know there were some pregnant pauses, but they were totally worth the amazing answers that we got. And so everyone, the Powers Haven secret is officially out in the world. So you can now go and read it. Your books are headed on your way that you have ordered. And 
Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And a big congrats to Melissa and Jessica. Um, a new book in the world is always so exciting. So, so much. And on that, we will say goodbye to everyone. I will final pregnant pause for them to say goodbye. I cut anyone off. We will see you next week.